Hello, this is Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with a historian and biographer, Ronald White Jr. And primarily we're going to discuss his most uh, recent biography about Ulysses S. Grant, which is a wonderful book, which I especially appreciated because of its uh, attention to uh, Grant's uh, religious affiliation and beliefs, which most biographers uh, tend to minimize or omit. And uh, Dr. White uh, has the benefit of a seminary education, having gone to Princeton Seminary. So he has a theological perspective that many historians and biographers uh, lack. He also has uh, written books about uh, Abraham Lincoln, and he currently is a reader at the Huntington Library in uh, California, and is also a senior fellow with the Trinity Forum in Washington, DC. So Ron, thank you so much for joining in this conversation. Mark, very good to be with you. Your book, of course, is a part of this uh, much wider ongoing uh, reappraisal of Ulysses Grant, uh, which in previous decades had been a little bit dismissive in terms of describing him as a supposedly uh, disastrous president, uh, maybe a good general, but one who won based on uh, overwhelming numbers and not necessarily uh, strategic expertise. Uh, but your book, among others, has uh, portrayed uh, Grant, uh, I think more fairly, as a, a very shrewd and uh, competent man, uh, even whose uh, presidency uh, has more to speak of it than is sometimes uh, realized. Uh, but tell us a little bit why you came to write a biography about Grant. Well, Grant was in my biography of Lincoln, and I was drawn to him as Lincoln was drawn to him. But I thought, as you have suggested, that he had been very much undervalued. My editor said, don't you think Grant is due for an upgrade? <laughs> and so I wanted to explore his life. And as you've also suggested, one of my very deep concerns is to tell what I would call the faith story of American leaders. I think this has been omitted or undervalued or not understood. And this is especially true for Grant. His Methodist story is really very important in understanding his life. And I wanted to kind of dig into that and see what it could tell me about him. Well, by almost all accounts, uh, Grant had a very uh, sterling uh, personal character, was always uh, honest, uh, may or may not have had uh, a drinking problem at some points uh, of his life, but uh, was uh, faithful to his wife, um, a good father, uh, loyal to his friends, in some cases too loyal and uh, <laughs> overly trusting. Uh, would you link that to uh, his religious upbringing in any way? Absolutely. Uh, he was born in Point Pleasant, Ohio, at age one, moved to Georgetown. His parents, uh, Jesse and Hannah, were founders of the Methodist Church in uh, Georgetown. She was a Presbyterian from Pennsylvania, but the circuit riders were there in Ohio, the Presbyterians were not. And I think a lot of his values really are, are Methodist values. I'm especially drawn to the whole sense of what I would call self-effacement. We might call it humility today. And I think this really characterizes him. I think he derived this from his mother. So when I try to tease out what are his values, they're really Methodist values that were so central and important in the middle of the 19th century. He, uh, as you say, he was not a showboater. He was very uh, understated, uh, did not advertise his accomplishments, uh, was a surprisingly very, uh, maybe not surprisingly, a very clear communicator, not just in his magnificent uh, memoir, but uh, his wartime communications, uh, very straightforward um, and not as, um, opaque and obtuse as uh, some other Civil War commanders have uh, communicated. Uh, would that also be linked to his uh, religious upbringing, do you think, his uh, talent for communication? You know, here was one of the ironies in my exploration that Grant was not a good public speaker, and he recognized that he declined opportunity to speak, but he was a very clear, compelling writer, not gone to verbosity. I think in, in the 19th century, again, Methodism was in, in a very positive way of kind of simple, straightforward faith, very experiential. And I think this again helped Grant in terms of his ability to write in such a clear way. He didn't fully understand that he was such a good writer until at the end of his life when diagnosed with cancer, wanting to know how he could support his wife, he started to write his memoirs. Uh, 
he, of course, was raised Methodist by his uh, church-going parents. Uh, he married a uh, devoutly Methodist uh, woman. Uh, yes. During their, their, during their courtship, they went to Methodist uh, events. And I guess for much of their marriage, he would go to church uh, with her, certainly later in life. Uh, and then uh, he had a friendship with um, one pastor whom you described with some uh, detail. I'm forgetting his name, but he later became a Methodist bishop. Right. Well, John Hale, Vince, when Grant served yeah. in the, the war with Mexico, came home, was posted to Oregon and California to help protect the settlers going west. But after seven, several years there, he fell into despair, missing his wife, missing a child he'd never even seen. And so he resigned from the army, went back to Missouri, lived there for six years, and then moved to Galena in far northwestern Illinois. And when he arrived in 1860, just one year before, a young 27-year-old pastor, John Hale Vincent, arrived to be the pastor of the Bench Street Methodist Church. And uh, he had a, a big impact on Grant. In fact, I want to read one sentence that I really much enjoyed as Grant later then became a famous Civil War general. Vincent wrote to him, and Grant, after the Battle of Shiloh, wrote back and offered, uh, offered these words. Uh, he said, I want to commend you for the pleasure of listening to your feeling discourses from the pulpit. Feeling discourses. Well, I like to say that Methodism is an experiential religion. In that way, it's a very democratic religion. You didn't have to have a certain education or you didn't have particular economic attainment, it was open to anyone. It was curious to me the way that Grant would reply and say, you're feeling discourses. Mm -hmm. I think that was terrific. He replied immediately. He's, he's on the battlefield of Shiloh, literally, and he writes back to Vincent. And they go on for what will become a lifelong relationship. Hmm. Uh, while president, uh, he and uh, Julia Grant, of course, attended uh, the Metropolitan uh, Methodist Church in downtown DC near the White House. And uh, at the very end of his life, as he's dying of uh, throat cancer, there's a prominent Methodist cleric who's at his deathbed uh, saying prayers, which became a little bit uh, controversial as uh, that minister publicized his final encounters with Ulysses Grant, which I understand that Mark Twain uh, would uh, mock at the time. You could share a little bit about that. Well, let me back up just a bit to, to get the beginning of what you said. The Methodists, as you well know, were the first denomination to build a kind of central church in Washington, D.C., the Metropolitan Church. And Grant, who was to be uh, inaugurated on March 4, 1869, said to the church, literally, let's dedicate the church four days before my inauguration. So he became a trustee of the church. Julia chaired the committee to uh, to complete the building, the finances of building the church, became very active in that church. But yes, you're telling the story that the, there's always a question, I guess, about someone's religious faith. And that particular minister, who Julia very much enjoyed, and Twain called a busybody, was there at the end of, of Grant's life. And of course, we have to take, in one way, with a grain of salt, Twain's comment, because Twain was a big skeptic and critic of organized religion, so he wasn't much impressed with the Methodist cleric. And uh, if I recall correctly, uh, Grant uh, would visit uh, the Methodist uh, campground um, Chautauqua in um, Northwest New York. Yes, this is quite an amazing story. Vincent, who now moves forward from Galena, serving in various capacities, in 1874, came up with the idea of establishing a new kind of campground near Buffalo. His point of view was that Methodists had been, yes, good on experience. Now we needed a kind of transition into more of an educational camp meeting. So he founded what is now the famous Chautauqua Institution, 1874, an initial two week uh, camp meeting aimed at public school teachers who would then become Sunday school teachers. So how is he going to publicize this? Well, he reaches out to Grant in the next year, 1875. Grant is now mired in the scandals of his administration. He's at, on vacation at his cottage in Long Branch, New Jersey, dealing with this, that, and the other. But when Vincent says, would you come to Chautauqua 
Grant says, yes, I will. So Grant arrives on a weekend in August of 1875. 20,000 people are there for that weekend. Really, it's in the woods of, of, of New York. And he becomes a, a featured guest. And I think, again, to me, this says so much about his appreciation. I, I sort of think of, of Vincent as kind of his spiritual mentor and that he understood uh, this person. He wanted to do whatever he could to promote what Vincent was doing. I think it's a tremendous story, again, not told in any of the other Grant biographies. Now, uh, you describe at length his uh, lifelong association with and influenced by Methodism, but you don't overstep. You don't try to uh, analyze no. uh, what his uh, heartfelt religious beliefs were, because I guess the evidence must be scant. That's a good way of saying it. No, I, I didn't want to overstate it. You know, I, I, I'm not saying that he's thinking in profound theological thoughts. I think this is important to him. Uh, in fact, in, in a certain sense, both his parents and he were a little bit put off by the sometimes over emotionalism of early Methodism in its experiential emphasis. This is not who they were. But yet I think it's important. And I think we often make the mistake of saying, well, how often did so and so attend church? Or in Lincoln's case, did he join the church? Well, no, he did. Lincoln wasn't a joiner. But I think joining a church, of course, meant so much more in the 19th century than it does today. And I want to ask the broader question, are the values that a person exhibits in his or her life, where do they come from? I, I spend a lot of time in my biographies looking at the early years of a person. And that's often when the formation of a person is taking place. And that's where religion, the Christian faith, in this case, Methodism, I think is extremely important. You, of course, have uh, written a biography of uh, Lincoln and also a book about his uh, profoundly theological uh, second inaugural address. Yes. Could, could you compare the religious beliefs of Grant and Lincoln in that both were profoundly influenced by the church and by Christianity, although it's very hard to say with great precision what their personal religious convictions are? Well, Lincoln, with no derogation to Grant, was a more intellectual person. And I try to make the point that the second inaugural is not simply quoting the Bible as we now know will be done in every inaugural address in our own day, but his is a profoundly theological address. And I attribute that again to his spiritual mentor, Phineas Densmore Gurley, was the pastor of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington. He was number one in his class at Princeton Seminary, a student of the theologian Charles Hodge. And increasingly, Lincoln attended the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. And at the death of Willie, the uh, second son to die, age 11 in 1862, Gurley preaches a remarkable sermon. We have that sermon in which he asks Abraham Lincoln to trust in biblical providence. Lincoln had done what many people then and now do as a young person. He rejected much of the faith of his parents. But then when life tumbled in, the death of the first child, Eddie, in 1850, the death of the second child, the crucible of the Civil War, he looks back to the faith of his parents. It was a Baptist faith on the edge of the Second Great Awakening in Kentucky and Southern Indiana. For Lincoln, it was too emotional. He had to find something more thoughtful, more rational. And that's what I think drew him to Presbyterians, both in Springfield, but more especially in, in, in uh, Washington, D.C. And I think it became very important to him. He doesn't make it public until the second inaugural, which is offered only 41 days before his death. Hmm. Clearly, uh, Lincoln was profoundly affected by the suffering of the war in his spirituality and in his uh, theology. Uh, is there any evidence that the same was true for Grant? Oh, I think so. I think, uh, especially let's focus on the issue of slavery. One of the, again, there's a lot of irony in doing biography. Grant's parents, his father especially, was strongly anti-slavery. In fact, the dilemma was that Grant married Julia, whose father was strongly pro-slavery. And uh, his, her father owned 30 slaves. And he gave her four slaves as a wedding gift. And Grant's parents would not come to the wedding, I think, for that particular reason. But when Grant traveled further and further. So anyway, as he starts the war, I think he doesn't have a strong viewpoint on slavery. 
it is more I am the deferential to political leadership and if this is the policy of Abraham Lincoln the Emancipation Proclamation I will carry it out but when he travels further and further south and these really poor African Americans come into the Union lines seeking protection you can begin to see Link Grant beginning to emotionally connect with these people. So during his presidency, and I think this is the highlight of his presidency, as his own Republican Party, which had championed the Emancipation Proclamation and had passed the three Reconstruction Amendments, 13, 14, 15, begin to retreat from their commitment to the freedmen, Grant steps forward. He steps forward. And when he realizes that the local and state courts will not uh, the, even if the Ku Klux Klan, which is the terrorist organization of the day, even if these men are arrested, they will never be prosecuted and judged by a local court. So he's willing to use the power of the federal government. So I think he really is drawn to the plight of African Americans. And this is behind his strong presidential leadership. And this is really essential to the ongoing reappraisal of Grant as president, isn't, isn't it? Uh, his uh, strong support for civil rights for black people. It is because right after the Civil War, we found the phenomenon of what's called the lost cause. The Confederate generals and newspaper editors began to articulate the point of view that the only reason the South lost was because they were overwhelmed by a, the large, overwhelming uh, Northern Army and by the industrial might of the North and by that butcher Grant who supposedly had far more casualties than Lee. Well, scholars have debunked that theory 40 years ago, but it's hard for that to seep into the popular imagination. So you're not going to praise Grant in the era of Reconstruction that follows is followed by Jim Crow. It's only, and even slow here after the Civil Rights Movement, that we look back and say, well, wait a second. I would argue that Grant is the last American president really until we get to John F. Kennedy with Martin Luther King and then Lyndon Baines Johnson, who's going to stand up forthrightly for African Americans. And I think that's a big part of the reappraisal of him, his decision to support the rights of African Americans. Now your book, I believe came out a short time before Ron Chernow's a biography of Grant. <laughs> yes. Yes. I have enjoyably read yours. I have not read it. Your book answered all of my questions. So I haven't felt the need to read read his book at this point. Uh, but uh, how would you contrast uh, your book with his? Well, I don't like to contrast with other authors. <laughs> he, he is very much interested in the issue of alcohol and alcoholism. Was Grant an alcoholic? He comes to a conclusion different than mine that he probably was much more afflicted by drinking. I think that the story is very mixed and I don't think that that story really plays out in his later years, certainly in his presidency. So it's, he's a very fine writer. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I can assume that uh, by the time you concluded your grand biography, your admiration for him uh, was enhanced. It really increased. You know, I, I, I had to admit a year or so, a year and a half into the writing, I didn't really know the man. I simply knew who he, what he had done. You know, he led the Union armies to victory. That's in my Lincoln biography. But my interest is what I call writing from the inside out. I'm interested in character. And I came to really admire the character of Grant, the kind of integrity of the man, the truthfulness of the man, the humility of the man. And I think, I think biographies are really two things. First, we're looking back at what happened in the past to find examples, but biographies are also mirrors to the present. And I think we very much need Grant's values today. These are values, sadly, that are too often missing in modern American politics. And therefore, I think his life is, is poignantly instructive right at this moment. If I read correctly, you're working on two future books. Uh one of which is about General Joshua Chamberlain. Yes. If you could tell us about that and about the other as well. Yes. Well, when you're an author, you know this, Mark, you speak at an audience and people will, someone will always say, and what is your next book? Mm -hmm. So I was doing a meet the author event at the Jonathan Club in downtown Los Angeles. And someone in the back of the room said, and what is your next book? <laughs> 
And I said, well, I don't know, do you? He said, I know. I said, well, tell me. He said, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't know too much about Chamberlain. Grant was not at Gettysburg. But Chamberlain is the Bowdoin College professor who was the hero of Little Round Top at Gettysburg. Uh, as his, he was defending the far left line of the Union Army on the second day. His men literally had run out of ammunition. They were being charged by Confederates from Alabama and Texas. And he, I believe, sort of as they lost almost all their ammunition, said charge and they lifted their bayonets and went down the hill and routed the Confederates. But again, what often happens in these stories is when Chamberlain finished college at Bowdoin, why his mother wanted him to be a minister, his father wanted him to go in the military. So he went to Bangor Theological Seminary for three years. And because he did not become a minister, he had three offers of calls to congregational churches in Maine, two in Maine, one in New Hampshire. People have skipped over that. I mean, they've given it two sentences, four sentences. I devote a whole chapter because I know as a seminary student and as the dean of a seminary that many people go to seminary today who do not become ministers, but for whom it's extremely important in the formation of their faith and their values. So I find the faith story of Chamberlain one that's been completely overlooked. And I think it's a key to understanding his remarkable values, how he becomes not simply the Civil War hero, but then governor of Maine four times, president of Bowdoin College for 12 years. And then as the Civil War veterans begin what I call now the second Civil War, writing about what did happen, what didn't happen, he becomes one of the key interpreters, writers, speakers about the Civil War. He's a fascinating figure. And uh, didn't he later clash with Grant at uh, Petersburg? Well, he, 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 at Petersburg, the year after Gettysburg, uh, he was wounded. Two surgeons told him he would die. He writes this amazing letter to his wife, Fanny, in which he says, I want to tell you of my faith in Jesus Christ and I do not want you to grieve for me. Amazing. He thinks he's mm -hmm. going to die. Mm -hmm. And Grant promotes him, quote, on the spot to mm -hmm. Brigadier General because of Chamberlain's bravery. Mm -hmm. and he, he then lives with terrible pain for the rest of his life. Six surgeries in Philadelphia. But he lives to be 86 and has mm -hmm. quite a remarkable life. Grant comes in August of 1865 to receive an honorary degree from Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine. He stays with Chamberlain. And in the final Grant processional procession to the funeral, the funeral procession in 1885, Chamberlain travels down to New York and is put in a carriage right nearly at the front of the procession. They had a great mutual admiration of each other. So uh, they did not clash. In fact, they were good friends for many years. My, right, my memory right. was incorrect. And yeah. uh, the, uh, the other book that you're working on. It's a book called Lincoln in Private. And what I've discovered through the years but hadn't fully acknowledged was that Lincoln had the habit of writing on little slips of paper, his ideas, his kind of intellectual diary. He never dated them, never titled them, never signed them. But we know they're Lincoln by his distinctive handwriting. So they've been spread across these multi-volume anthologies of Lincoln's writings. The earliest authors, his two secretaries, John Nicolay and John Hay, called them fragments because many of them are fragmentary. They end in the middle of a sentence, sometimes in the middle of a word. They're now sort of uh, dusty and we've lost a little of them. But they're a key to what I call the private Lincoln behind the public Lincoln. His law partner, William Herndon, called him the most shut mouthed man I've ever met. Lincoln didn't reveal, especially did not reveal his feelings and often not his innermost thinking. And I'm writing this book to sort of bring out these fragments, notes to himself, which are Lincoln's way of puzzling out how does he understand slavery? What, are he, what does he think are the problems with the birth of the Republican Party? In 1856, he runs for a seat in the Senate. It's then elected by state legislators, and he loses. And he's very magnanimous in public. Well, it, it's all right, I'm fine. But in private, he writes this note to himself. And he says, my life is nothing but a failure. 
nothing but a flat failure. Well, he would never have said that in public, but he says it in private. And the most profound of all is in the middle of the Civil War, after the defeat of the Second Battle of Manassas, he sits down, we believe on that day, September 2nd, 1862, and he writes this remarkable document which begins, the will of God prevails. Each side claims to know this will of God. One must be, both cannot be right. And then he offers this profound sentence, theological sentence. It may be that God's purpose is different from the purpose of either party. And yet God uses human effort to affect his purpose. Well, no one knew of that document, but I think it's actually the, the, the foundation of his later second inaugural address. It's kind of a signpost to me of his spiritual odyssey, of his faith journey. It's extremely profound. And this will be the final chapter in my book, Lincoln in Private. Well, Dr. Ronald White, Jr., a biographer of Grant Lincoln and soon General Joshua Chamberlain, Thank you so much for a very insightful and enjoyable conversation. Thank you, Mark, for who you are and what the, your organization is. I'm appreciative of both. Thank you.